Welcome everyone to Voices of Wentworth. My name's Kath Naish and I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and by paying our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge the country, elders and custodians of the lands you are joining us from. Voices of Wentworth was established to address the perceived disconnect between what voters want and what they actually get in terms of representation on federal policy. Our goals are to engage our local community, to better understand what citizens care about and to advocate for the issues they support. We know from polling and from our own voter survey that climate action and integrity in politics are two of the top concerns for Wentworth voters. All of our events are available to watch via our website and our YouTube channel, so please subscribe so that you never miss an event. And this event is also being recorded. So tonight we're looking at the question of integrity in politics, which is a broad topic ranging from the influence of money in politics, parliamentary and ministerial standards, and the impact of misleading political advertising to the establishment of an independent and effective federal integrity commission. Many improvements are needed within our political systems to regain public trust in our national leaders. Moreover, integrity in our political systems is arguably central to achieving sensible policy on a range of issues such as climate change, women's safety, national security, environmental protection and economic reform. Over the past week, we've been bringing community screenings of new documentary film, The Big Deal, to Wentworth. And we are thrilled to have the film's director, Craig Rewcastle, here with us on our panel tonight. If you haven't seen the film, it's available to watch in cinemas outside of lockdown areas and will be aired on the ABC from the 19th of October. But if you are in lockdown and can't wait that long, please get in touch with us to find out how you can access it sooner. Craig is a writer, a comedian, and one of the founders of The Chaser. He's also famous for going through your bins on the war on waste. We're also privileged to be joined by Professor John Daly of the University of Melbourne Law School, who's one of Australia's leading public policy thinkers and was the inaugural chief executive of the Grattan Institute. He'll be taking us to his recent report, Gridlock, Removing the Barriers to Policy Reform, which has been hailed as a landmark analysis of how Australia's institutions affect the prospects of policy reform. We're also very happy to welcome back His Honour Anthony Wheely QC, a former Justice of the Supreme Court of New South Wales Court of Appeal, and now Chair of the Centre for Public Integrity, which is an independent think tank dedicated to preventing corruption, protecting the integrity of our accountability institutions and eliminating undue influence of money in politics in Australia. After hearing from our speakers, we'll then go to some questions. And if you've got a question for one of our speakers, please can you type the word question in capitals, followed by your question, and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. So type it into the chat. Um, we've got quite a few people on the call today, about 80 people at the moment. Um, so this will really help our moderating team. So to start us off, I'll hand over to Craig to give us an overview of The Big Deal. Welcome to you, Craig. Hello, Kath. Um, yeah, look, the big deal. I mean, it's it's a movie about about money and politics. It's a movie about kind of the influence. What influences policy? What influences politics? And it's see, I, I'm behind the cameras this time. I'm a director, and it follows Christian Van Vuren, who actually, you know, Bondi hipsters. That's deep in Wentworth territory, of course. Um, <clears throat> so you know, Christians from Bondi hipsters, and it kind of go follows him. You know, he's not a political tragic, but follows him kind of looking into this issue. And I just come off the back of doing two documentaries about climate change, and it definitely feels like the kind of you know the hidden reason why we're very recalcitrant in Australia, and not perhaps not very hidden reason, is about the influence of money and influence of you know, re revolving doors and that kind of stuff in our political system. So it's kind of you know, it's looking at how our policy gets messed up by this. And in Australia, you know, it's kind of surprising when we looked into it, like we're not worse than America overall, but on transparency, we definitely are. And the trend is definitely bad. We're, we're kind of, we're there with some of the worst nations that have, you know, no caps on donations, no caps on spending, terrible transparency, very late declarations as well. So there's a lot of that stuff. And we kind of looked at how that affects, it's not just climate policy. I mean, it's gambling, it's, all manner of things, health, everything really gets affected by this system. So that's what Big Deal's about. Um, and look, hopefully some of you have seen it. Some of you will see it. 
uh, you know, as, as Kath said, you can see it through through uh, Voices for Wentworth, uh, but also it will be on the ABC as a two-part doco later on. So, yeah, look, I'm getting into it. It doesn't show every aspect of this. Look, there are so many different aspects to this, but it really starts that conversation about what's wrong there, hopefully. Yeah, well, thanks, Craig. And we'll we'll definitely get, we've got lots of questions for you um, a little bit later on. So we might um, move on to John, if we can get you to give us a summary of your recent report, um, including why national policy reform gridlock is a problem and how we can address it. Many thanks. So what the report does is that it looks at um, all of the major recommendations in Grattan reports over 11 and a half years. You probably don't agree with all of them, but hopefully you believe that we bat better than average. Um, and we took that as a sample of reforms. To be blunt, most of those reforms have been around for a long time. It's not that we claim massive originality for any of them, um, but we do argue the case for each of them. And what we did in the gridlock report was look at those, we summarised them up, and we said, in effect, these turn out to be about 73 reforms out of about 110 reports, because some reports um, cover, um, some reforms are covered by more than one report. And what those, what that analysis shows is, firstly, a very large number of substantive reforms are not happening. So about two thirds of the reforms that we talked about and recommended have not happened. Uh, and that's a much lower hit rate than you would have seen, for example, during the Hawke-Keating era or the first couple of terms of the Howard government. And the second thing that we did was analyse the story of each of those reforms and ask why have they not happened? Um, what we discovered was that by and large, if, if a reform was unpopular, it never happened. That's a big difference to the Hawke and Keating era where you know many things um, that they did that were worthwhile in the long run were unpopular at the time. Um, things that crossed party ideology and, and, and in particular cross beliefs that have no basis in rationality. Indeed, they're often irrational, i.e. there's good evidence that they're just wrong. Um, uh, that stopped a large number of reforms. Um, uh, and there were a significant number that were held up by vested interests. Although very interestingly, where there was a really good evidence base other than the Grattan reports, um, often the vested interests lost. When there was no such evidence base, uh, they tended to win. Um, and when we then thought about, well, what is, why is this happening? What's going on? Why is it that reforms that are unpopular no longer get prosecuted by politicians? Why is it that they're so influenced by the sort of shibboleths of their party? Why is it that there's not as much independent evidence as there used to be? We came to some very clear conclusions. Essentially, our institutions are weaker than they used to be. Um, so our political parties are much more um, essentially, uh, the, the technical word in the literature is they're cartels. Um, they're essentially acting for the um, interests of the people who are MPs and the people who are advisors, and they're much less acting in the interests of their membership. And of course, their membership is typically a smaller and smaller proportion of the Australian population. Um, so our parties have become cartels, which essentially look after the interests of the people who are MPs, as opposed to worrying mostly about the public interest. Um, uh, those ministerial advisers have become much more powerful than they used to be, and ironically, much less accountable. Um, our public service is weaker than it used to be. Um, uh, lobbying is much more of a big deal than it used to be. Um, money in politics and donation regimes are much weaker and much less effective um, than they should be. Although, to be fair, a lot of the states have got um, situ uh, have got re legislation in place governing that stuff, uh, but the Commonwealth does not. The Commonwealth, of course, still lacks a serious independent commission against corruption. And the conclusion of the report was that this weakening of our institutions is itself one of the major barriers to getting substantial reform um, on all of those other policy areas we care about. Everything from tax to welfare, to health, to education. Um, the failure of our institutions, the weakening of our systems of governance is what is standing in the way of getting substantial reform in other substantial areas that would increase the prosperity of Australians in the long run. Thanks, John. Some of those points that you've made are covered very skillfully in the film that Craig has has produced. So we'll come back to some of those points um, in a few minutes once we've heard from Anthony. So Anthony, um, we've spoken on a number of occasions about the need for an independent federal integrity commission. 
um, which was promised by Scott Morrison prior to the 2019 election. In February this year, um, independent MP for Indi, Helen Haynes, joined us to take us through her bill, which is drafted and ready to go. But we've still not seen any legislation from the government. There's been some consultation um, and some exposure draft papers, but no legislation has been presented yet. Um, and we know that there was no provision made in this, uh, this year's budget um, for the ICAC. So um, can you let us know the current status of the government's position and the Labour Party's recent announcements regarding their own proposals um, and what, if any, are the key differences between the positions of the various political parties and Helen's, Helen Haynes' existing bill? The qualities of three qualities we certainly demand of government are accountability, transparency and, um, and perhaps most importantly, integrity. And, it has been significantly diminished in recent years. Um, I mean, it's interesting to note that uh, Transparency International's um, Corruption Perception Index shows that we've slid down the greasy pole in our standing uh, in international terms concerning corruption. Uh, this um, sort of continuing failure to be accountable, to be transparent and to act with integrity. And, and one of the uh, other reasons for our low standing internationally is that we don't have a federal um, uh, body that examines uh, corruption. Uh, and, you know, we do have um, ICACs, I'll call them for short, a shorthand term, we do have ICACs in all the states and territories. Um, they're not beyond criticism, but on the whole, they do a great job. And um, when you look at the federal body, uh, we have nothing. Uh, just to give you a brief background to it, I remember in 2015, I went to Canberra for the first time, the fledgling uh, chair of Transparency International, and we were putting forward arguments about why we should have a federal ICAC. And uh, we were met by um, George Brandis and his legal team, and they uh, explained deeply to us and to the uh, committee that we didn't need a federal ICAC because there was no corruption at all at federal level and there never had been. And I presume he intended to convey that there never would be. Um, I must say it was a, an astonishing performance and it really set me back in my seat. Anyway, we went ahead and uh, as, a, as a committee, uh, the National Integrity Committee of rather boring old retired judges put our uh, skills to try to devise a, a good system and we came up with a design feature that said you ha must have one an independent body, you need to cover the entire federal sphere, uh, you need to have a broad definition of corruption, you need to have wide powers for like a royal commission, uh, you need to hold public hearings where it's necessary and you need to make public findings. So all of those things uh, along with of course doing your best to protect people's reputation and giving people procedural fairness was the design. And so for the next three years, I went back and forth to Canberra, sat in front of Christian Porter on a number of occasions as he steadfastly uh, went along with the George Brandis line until 2018, when the government announced that it would support um, ICAC. Uh, but Porter stuck to his guns and about a year and a half later produced a draft exposure bill which incorporated all of the shocking features that we'd said would make it ineffective. And effectively what it would do was it would shield politicians and the vast majority of public servants from ever being scrutinised. Uh, that's, that's what's wrong with the model from the government. You can just put it in a nutshell. It's designed to protect politicians it's designed to protect their staff. It's designed to make sure that two thirds of the public service are never scrutinized and that an investigation can, can't even get underway. And even if you did have an investigation, uh, in the uh, rare case where you might be able to have an investigation about a politician or the politician's staff, you couldn't have a public hearing and you could not make any public findings critical of the politician or their staff. So, I don't know what everybody listening to this thinks of that, but we thought it was pretty poor. So against that background, you've had three attempts, uh, two from independents and one from the Greens to introduce an effective anti-corruption bill into Parliament. Kathy McGowan, uh, originally, 
Uh, then later on, Larissa Waters for the Greens, and in more recent time, Helen Haynes as an independent. And each of the uh, bills that were introduced were entirely effective and were quite different from the dismal effort that the government had put forward. So um, Cathy McGowan's bill, uh, of course, didn't survive the election. Uh, in 2019, the Greens bill was shuffled off to interminable committees and Helen Haynes' bill is in a delicate position now. Um, fingers crossed that it might uh, do some good. But as Kath Nash pointed out in the last budget, the, um, the, uh, the budget figure for the amount of money that the government had set aside for a National Integrity Commission was zero. Um, I like to call it a donut for integrity. Um, and that shows you that they're not serious, that they've never been serious, that they don't want to be held accountable and they don't want a body that's going to hold them accountable. It's rather amusing really, Kath, isn't it, that uh, Christian Porter's latest escapades uh, with the blind trust and the invisible donors uh, has led him to resign. Uh, and yet he, he's the very architect of this scheme that was so effective. It could never have examined his dealings uh, and any question of whether he was uh, in breach uh, of uh, ministerial standards. So we come then finally to the latest development, which is the Labor Party has finally, although it's for a long time said it would support it, it didn't do so in any particularly concrete way until uh, June this year, when it's released a fact sheet, which shows that the body it would establish would have certain characteristics and they've wedded themselves to these correct characteristics. It's quite a long document, so I'll just summarise it, that what this body would do uh, if, if the Labor Party were in power and uh, would put forward its model, it would be able to uh, investigate on its own initiative It'd be able to take referrals from whistleblowers and members of the public. It would examine the whole of the federal sphere, all politicians, their staff and so on. Uh, it would have the power to investigate serious and systemic corruption, uh, both before and after its establishment. It would have the power to hold public hearings and also make findings of fact, including a corrupt conduct finding. Um, so you can see immediately that it is in marked contrast to the uh, draft exposure bill of the federal government. And it is consistent with Helen Haynes's bill and consistent indeed with the earlier bills from Cathy McGowan and Larissa Waters. So one party's left out in the cold. And I ask myself, where do we stand now? And, you know, I think frankly, we're at a low ebb and, you know, it's up to local communities now to make their voices heard on this topic and the general topic of accountability, transparency and integrity. Yeah. Thank you, Anthony. Um, very useful summary and good to hear what the Labour Party is proposing. I haven't seen any documentation around that yet, but um, it sounds like it's pretty similar to Helen Haynes's bill. Not as detailed, it's only a statement of principles. Uh, her bill's about 400 pages long, so she's done all the hard work, but the, but the same principles are enshrined, I'm happy to say. So you, you'd, you'd say that it's fit for purpose in the sense that it, it I know that one of the things that you're, you were concerned about is the, the need for public hearings, so it, it obviously ticks that box, yep. um, at least, you know, assuming that their legislation follows through on what they're saying right now. Um, okay, well, we'll talk a bit more about the ICAC proposals in a few minutes. So I just want to go to some uh, questions now. We've got a few questions that we've already received from um, supporters. So we'll start with those and then we'll move on to the questions in the chat. Um, so we're going to start with you, Craig. The, the big deal demonstrates that both the coalition and Labour, the two major um, parties in the parliament, receive significant donations from large corporates and private donors. I think the figures were around 165 million for the Liberal Party and 126 million dollars for the Labour Party around the last time of the last election. 
um, and that public information about those is difficult to get sometimes. So we might get disclosure information about certain amounts, but not necessarily straight away and sometimes not until quite a long time later. And some of that money is completely hidden. Um, so given the impact that parties' reliance on donations seems to be having in delaying policy reform, do you have any thoughts on whether it's time to introduce some reform in this area about political donations? So um, capping them potentially, or even maybe banning them altogether? Yeah, look, totally. Just in terms of that, that figures, the 160 million and those figures, they're actually the total budget of the party. So that includes as well public funding. And that's one of the interesting things about this is that we did actually increase public funding to the parties as a way of overcoming, you know, this kind of corrupting influence of donations. But at the same time, we didn't get rid of the donations and we didn't cap them at all. So it's this strange situation where we give the political parties a lot of money to run campaigns, but also to just let them top it up as much as possible. And yeah, one of the first things I would definitely do is a cap on donations and a cap on spending. Because uh, interestingly, both Sam Dastyari and Malcolm Turnbull in the recording of the movie called it an arms race. Because as long as there's no caps, they're in an arms race to try and get more and more money there. And that's the problem we have. That's part. So we really need, we need a lot better rules there. And it's interesting. It goes back to, as Anthony said, you know, Brand is saying there's no corruption here. There's, there's a partial truth to that because there's not rules that really restrict a lot of the things that we would think are a problem. So we look at in the movie things that are legal. And yet I think a lot of the things you look at, you go, that's to me what I define as corruption. So yeah, it really is about bringing in much tighter rules here. And it's about fixing the balance, I think. Um, it, it, it's, you've got to fix the balance both ways, really. At the moment, the voice of large donations, large money through, whether through lobbying, whether through revolving door, whether through donations is being heard a lot more than the public. And as, as, as John said, political parties no longer have very much of a grassroots base to them. So in terms of the voices they're hearing, they've got less grassroots and much more coming from the donation and the, the bigger end of town. And we need to rebalance that. We need to put a bigger cap on the, that side. But we also need to get more activity from the public. And that can happen through people joining political parties or people joining movements like Voices For, because that's another way to really revitalise in the community and getting them involved in that. So that the voices, it's kind of like pumping up the voice of the public at the same time that we're trying to reduce the voice from the big end of town or those that have large access to capital, because that's really the problem at the moment. So yeah, look, I think caps on donations, caps on spending is really important to that. Uh, proper rules as to re revolving door after leaving office, there's a lot of these little rules that need to be set. And, and I think Grattan, the Grattan report did a fantastic report on that actually a few years ago that set out so many different criteria. I'll let, I tell you what, I'll leave, I'll let John and, and Anthony do the exact legal requirements to bring this about. But at the moment, the balance is just really out of kilter. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a few surprises, like there's a few moments in the film where Christian gets quite shocked um, by some of the things that are revealed. And it's, um, <laughs> I think As we all do, like, you know, it's just like... I, I think some of us that are watching more closely than others are not so shocked. Like, we kind of know that this is going on. It um, it does upset us and, annoy, you know, we are doing what we're doing largely because we want to fix it. Yeah. Um, but it, it is it is shocking. I mean, I, I remember... The... I know it goes on too. I, look, I know it goes on too. I was, this wasn't a mystery to me either, but I don't know there's something about somebody just sitting there and casually saying, you know, I spent a hundred grand to have a lunch with the premier and the ministers or whatever. That was the Labour Party that he was doing that with. Mm -hmm. It's something just kind of ridiculous about it. You go, this is <laughs> this it's just, this thing is well and truly out of kilter if that is normality for somebody in this. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'll, I'll go on to John now in a second, but just to make the comment that it does strike you as a viewer that what's the point of voting if, you know, people who've got money, $100,000 to spend on a lunch with a, with a politician, get access and get listened to when it comes to making decisions. I mean... It, yeah, no, it's true, but I, I think just John said, look, it's not... The thing you've got to remember in this is it's like... I think some people have a simplistic view. They're like, every policy reflects the donations and that. And that's not, it's, it's a more complex system we've got here. Our voices and, you know, the votes and that still matter. Um, it's about that the, at the moment, the kind of, the size of those voices is very out of kilter. And that's why the Voices for Movement is fascinating in the way it's bringing communities back together and trying to 
you know, bring that voice out. So we, I mean, we go to Indi at the end. It's one of the kind of up, uplifting parts of the movie. It's kind of really nice at the end. We're actually kind of traipsing through the crap of the system in Australia to finally get some nice examples at the end where you go, okay, there's examples here which can maybe reframe and change the way we're actually looking at politics. So, yeah, look, it's not, it's, you know, it's not a foregone conclusion. It's not like the system is totally broken, but it really needs some fixing at the moment. Yeah, um, well, yeah, and looking at the side of the film when they talk about the comparison between what's happening in the US and what might end up happening here. And we've had these, you know, riots this week in Victoria, which are very disturbing. And yes, we want to try to get things back on track before it's, you know, gets a lot worse. Um, no, it's trust in government. I mean, it, like it's COVID has shown that trust in government is a really important thing in a nation and the countries that have done best in, around the world are those with that trust and that means we need to focus more on getting that trust. Absolutely. Um, all right, well, I'll move on to John now. We've got a question for you, which sort of follows on to that. Um, so your report focuses on the gridlock on economic reforms and concludes that certain reform agendas are unlikely to be adopted in the current political climate if they're unpopular. And you mentioned that just now. But we know that um, certain reforms that are, for example, things like there is a lot of strong community support in Australia for a National Integrity Commission. Um, from the ABC Talks survey done recently showed that, that was, there was very high levels of support for that and also for climate action. So given that there's gridlock in these areas of work as well, would you agree that this adds weight to the need for a new approach in Australian federal politics to deliver this much needed policy reform because the two party system we've got at the moment has failed to do so? I, I think that's exactly right. Um... And I think it's particularly an issue with these institutional reforms because the problem with the current institutions is that they serve the interests of um, two major parties very, very well. Uh, and there's a reason they haven't changed, even though reforming those institutions is, as you say, by and large, wildly popular. Uh, and so there's two things going on. One is... The major political parties don't think that they will lose any votes um, by trash, and in particular, they won't lose votes to the other side um, by either trashing a bunch of conventions or by failing to put um, new checks and balances in place so that our institutions work better. And they're probably right about that. By and large, um, concerns about institutional integrity, at least historically, have not moved many votes. It just doesn't cut through as an issue. It's never been towards the top of the list of voter concerns, apart from two kind of very particular situations. So the first is where um, it, you have public hearings that are running night after night or day after day after day, and therefore running on television night after night after night, it does cut through into public consciousness. And in practice, that's been either because you had a royal commission like the Fitzgerald Royal Commission, or you have public hearings at an independent commission against corruption. Um, that means that this stuff really starts to cut through. And of course, one of the issues is that at a federal level, neither of those two things is likely to happen in a hurry. Um, so that's situation one in which it's cut through. And the other situation in which historically major reform has happened on these institutional issues is when minor parties have held the balance of power in the lower house. And bear in mind, of course, that because we've got single member electorates um, for lower houses in Australia, by and large, independents tend to come from the centre. Um, as you know, I'm fond of reminding people, you know, if you look at the current series of independents at a federal level, pretty much all of them are in the centre. And I even include Bob Catter in that category, who, you know, by Queensland standards, is probably a centrist. Um, and inherently, those independent candidates do tend to campaign much more on integrity issues. And inherently, when they hold the balance of power, it's one of the things that they can ask for from either side, no matter who they decide to um, support, and it won't um, lead to them losing support with their own supporters, because it's the one thing that they've talked about, which is distinctive to what the two major parties have talked about, and which distinctively their supporters um, are uh, uh, behind. And it's a contrast to what happened, for example, to the Lib Liberal Democrats um, in the UK, where they went into coalition, but they effectively signed up to a whole series of 
of substantial policy changes that many of their supporters didn't like. My suspicion is that if they had stayed outside of the Tory tent and simply insisted on a bunch of institutional reforms and then said, we will take every other policy you know, decision as it comes, they might well have done much better in the long run um, electorally. Um, and similarly, when we look at independence in Australia, where they have really gone for those kind of institutional reforms, by and large, they've tended to get re-elected. So I think those are the two situations in which we do see institutional reform. Um, to be blunt, I would be surprised if we get much institutional reform out of our major political parties, particularly at a federal level. I'm pleasantly surprised, but not complaining, that the ALP has got behind a serious federal um, uh, corruption commission. But I don't think you're going to see them getting behind serious reform on political donations, on lobbying, on revolving doors, uh, on ministerial advisors, on the independence or otherwise of the public service anytime soon, whereas I suspect we could see independence getting behind basically all of those issues, and many of them have certainly got behind a lot of that agenda already. Labor already says that they show all donations, declare all donations above $1,000, whereas the actual system requires it only over 14500 Well, And they've said that that in place. So, that, you know, they've, they've, they've done a couple of little moves on the, the donation front, but the problem is there's so many... It's a lot of holes in the system at the moment, so it's not to yeah. say they've been closed they're, all. They're, they're not promising to close any of the holes, which mean that a very yeah. large proportion of the money that comes their way is technically not a donation. So, as I'm sure you no doubt point out, yeah. um, you it, know, it was I, very I, hard to tra track it. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I know. Um, I mean, you know, you can pay fifty thousand dollars, you know, for a dinner, and that doesn't count as a donation. I mean, it's mm. it's as you say, the, the system is kind of more holes than net. Yeah, that's uh, great. <laughs> uh, and, and they like it that way. Um, and they're certainly not talking about capping campaign expenditure, which, as you mm. point out, is one of the really important reforms because it stops the arms race. And one of the questions that I think is in the chat is, you know, well, but, you know, doesn't that just live, let the Clive Palmers through? Which the answer is, well, number one, Clive Palmer would have counted as a political party, so the campaign, the campaign spending would have applied to him too, and he would have gone, well, assuming any kind of sensible limit was set, he went over it in the last election. Um, and you also, even if he doesn't constitute himself as a party, the way that those kind of regimes work is that they also limit the spending that, can, that other organisations can make during election campaigns. And I wouldn't be suggesting that we should stop people who are not political parties from saying anything in an election campaign. We are a broader democracy than that. Um, but on the other hand, I can see very powerful arguments saying that we should limit how much third parties can spend in the same way that we should be limiting how much um, political parties can spend. Because if you're, if you're trying to constrain the arms race, that needs to be part of the story. And, and coming on to the point that you made a bit earlier about the major parties aren't going to make what don't want to focus on issues around integrity reform because it you know doesn't necessarily suit them and that might be something that independent independent candidates are more successful at doing but keeping that question of integrity in the mind of voters when it underlines so many issues like we're discussing today we'll go on i think there's some questions later about the other types of areas that integrity in politics affects you know it seems to really affect a lot of different um, areas of policy um, and you know can we only be make, making decisions about those things every time we get the chance to vote in an election I mean that's something that uh, just brings me on to the question I've got for Anthony next which is in relation to Dave Sharma's position on the federal ICAC um, because we've spoken to, to Anthony previously about this and he's met with Dave Sharma to find out what Dave's position is um, and Anthony you've told us that Dave concedes that criminal corruption should be investigated, but he maintains that ordinary decisions of government shouldn't be scrutinised by a panel of external experts. Rather, they should just be judged by the electorate at election time. Um, so we've discussed this previously and how that really doesn't add up when you've got numerous um, what you might describe as scandals happening throughout the term that need to be addressed other than at election time. But have, Anthony, have you had any further interactions with Dave Sharma on this topic um, since we last spoke? And has there been any movement 
from here more amongst government MPs in support of ineffective federal ICAC or for other integrity measures such as political donation reform or addressing misleading political advertising, for example? No, I don't think so. I mean, uh, just to add to what we were saying about the political donations, uh, you know, and, and a topic that's very closely allied to that is the need for reform in uh, connection with truth in political advertising. Clive Palmer springs to mind immediately. Uh, you know, we do have in two of our states in Australia uh, legislation that that uh, that attempts to um, um, bring about truth in political advertising at election time, but we don't have anything federally. And uh, again, like those other reforms we've discussed, no one seems to be too keen on the idea, but you know, it's just another thing. But coming back to the concept of my discussion with Dave Sharma, I, I don't think, I mean, I had a very pleasant talk with Dave Sharma. Uh, he was very open, uh, and, but he was really, I don't know if he was aware of it, he's really just trotting out the party line, which is to say, look, if you're going to have a federal body that investigates corruption, it should only investigate criminal offences. Uh, we tried to explain or coerce him into believing that there's a lot of bad behaviour that might fall short of a criminal offence, but which the community would regard as corrupt conduct. And that needs to be investigated as well. So, for example, um, the sports rort scandal, so-called, uh, the car park allocations, the Leppington Triangle, uh, even the most recent uh, business with Christian Porter. Th these are all matters where you can't uh, possibly say at a threshold level that there's evidence of a criminal offence being committed. Um, and so the government would say, and Dave Sharma did say, well, we don't want those sort of decisions being investigated. Uh, if you don't like them, uh, you can vote us out at election time. And that's the only time that there should be any scrutiny of them <laughs> by the electorate. Uh, of course, that's so ridiculous, uh, with all due respect to Dave, because, you know, the, the electorate are not in a position to investigate anything at election time. And election time, as I've already said, is the time when the great lies are poured out on both sides, on every side. We're besieged with lies and misrepresentations and blandishments to vote for one party or another. So it is just... Uh, it's just a, a party line that you, that is leading nowhere. We need to have a body that can look carefully, uh, either because a whistleblower has brought it to the body's attention or because of its own initiative, it sees a concern about behaviour at government level that should be investigated. And it may or may not result in a criminal offence uh, being detected, but it may still properly um, come to a conclusion that what's involved is within the broad definition of corrupt conduct and should be publicly exposed for that reason. Anthony, can I just add to that? I mean, I think one of the things that Dave and that entire line um, is, is, is alighting over is that there are many things that, um, many laws that tell government how it is supposed to operate. Uh, and there are, unfortunately, a large number of examples, and sports rorts is one, in which those rules were either deliberately or at very charitably, carelessly ignored. Certainly people knew that the rules were being broken. But because there is no criminal penalty for those rules, technically that is not criminal conduct. It is unlawful conduct. We claim to be a government of laws. But there is no effective sanction for failing to comply with those laws. It is that failure to comply with laws in terms of how government is set up that is a large part of the problem in our institutions. And to say that a federal ICAC is not going to do anything unless there is formally a criminal penalty attached to a breach of the law means that you are cutting it off from doing some of the things that are really, really fundamental to what is wrong with our institutions. Yes, I agree with that. And I mean, for example, an important role of state ICACs uh, is to educate the public service as to what I would call ethical behaviour, sensible behaviour, to avoid the pitfalls and so on. There's this enormous educational activity that such a body can carry out. 
and it can even give advice to governments in relation to tendering uh, processes and so on. And it does at state level, but none of that is present at federal level. And so, um, you know, as you say, that there's no deterrent really. But I do think that if there were a federal ICAC, one with effective powers, it, it would be permitted to make findings of corrupt conduct, even though no illegality was involved. And uh, a good, you know, to take an example of it, of course, with the sports rorts affair, there were, as you say, at best uh, careless adherence to uh, legislative or guideline requirements. But where it's done for political advantage, where money that is taxpayer money is shown to be spent for partisan or political advantage, then that falls squarely within the concept of corrupt conduct. And so such a finding would be very unpleasant for a government that did it uh, where it properly investigated. Thanks very much for that. I'm going to um, pass to Delia now. Hopefully she has got some questions from the chat that we can um, put to you. Are you there, Delia? I am here. Thank you. Um, yes, I have so many questions. Uh, we could probably go for another hour, so I'm going to have to roll some of them uh, together. Some of the questions have come by direct message, so they may not appear in um, the chat for everybody. Um, and in fact, a whole bunch have just come through. Very low well. transparency for this. <laughs> oh, well, you know, one only has so much control here. Um, I'll try and get to the ones that have just been added um, after this. So I've tried to group them by, by topic. I thought I'd start with um, one uh, which has not been directed to any particular person, so I'll sort of um, throw it to each of you in turn, I suppose is that um, are you aware of the framework for integrity reform that the Australian Democracy Network has put forward as part of its Our Democracy campaign? And do you support those reforms? Maybe I'll throw it to the panel to see who has who is aware of that to begin with, because that would be a prerequisite for answering it. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. And yeah, I think it, it, there's some great stuff that, that yeah, I do support that. I mean, look, most of the most of the different groups with Democracy Network or Grattan, or everyone comes to a similar position. There's slight slight variations, but everyone basically comes to a similar position. I think that we could head go forward in that. The, the main problem at the moment is really one of some of the unfortunately high court cases have probably put some little roadblocks in. in in the path of some reforms, although I don't think that's too problematic long term. So, yeah, no, that's it's great stuff there. Excellent, thank you. Um, does uh, Anthony or John do you want to have uh, do you want to comment on that framework? Yeah, if I could just add um, one, a couple of things to that. Um, one is, you know, we very much tend to focus in this space on ICACs and lobbying and donations and expenditure and all of that, and all of that stuff matters. Um, and it matters a lot, and ICAC in particular matters because if you don't have one of those, then none of the other rules are going to stick. Um, but I think that there's a much longer list in terms of the things that are um, deteriorating with um, the quality of our institutions. So we've already spoken about pork barrelling generally. Um, more particularly, you know, governments have been playing very fast and loose with the rules that we have put around the award of grants um, that, you know, otherwise could be turned pork barrelling. Um, uh, there's a lot of concern about the award of contracts um, to those who are well connected um, with pretty minimal levels of process. Um, for example, the Manus Island contract for Paladin, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation that got you know several hundred million dollars on a process that can only be described as pretty short. Um, a bunch of water um, purchases where you know it doesn't look as beautiful as it might. And, you know, all of these things like pork barrelling, award of contract grants, um, appointments to government bodies and, uh, and so on, um, politically motivated dismissal of public servants, the role of ministerial advisers, all these things matter as well. And they ultimately go to integrity and they ultimately go to the quality of our governance. And therefore, they ultimately go to the quality of the substantial policy, economic, social and otherwise, that emerges from our governments. 
Totally agree. It's just that would have taken it in my case, we've taken a five hour documentary to cover all of the things. It was actually fascinating doing this documentary because there were so many different bits of kind of government corruption coming up in the process of doing it. And you had to go, no, no, we can't follow that one as well. There are so many ways in which this system is currently being corrupted. And, and you know, but it's you see the comment about this is very depressing and the thing. I really do think there are some positive things there. Like it is the fact that there's a real growing motivation of people in, in public getting involved in their democracy. And that's so crucial to, you know, the kind of that level of outrage being expressed to um, politicians is a crucial part of getting change here. Yeah. But good news, Craig, you've got plenty of things to do for the next few years. <laughs> Uh, which which does lead to uh, one of the questions that's come up in the chat. Um, given the wide range of different proposals for reform that have been put out by different institutions, um, if you, there was just one one reform to put forward, what would be that big ticket item? So I've changed my view on this, which is always the kind of advantage of writing a report. Um, I actually think an independent commission against corruption is more important than I realised um, for two reasons. I mean, obviously, you want it to deal with with corrupt conduct and all of those are the kind of, if you like, conventional reasons. And, and don't get me wrong, they're really important. But it has two other things that I think um, mean that unless we get that one right, it's going to be hard to get everything else right. So the first I've, I just mentioned a little earlier, which is a lot of the rules that we want to put in place, everything from uh, political donations to, for example, you know, proper process around dismissing public servants, unless there's somebody that can actually enforce those rules, it's probably gonna be a waste of time putting them in place. We will have the situation we have at the moment, which is that our major political parties know perfectly well they are breaking the rules much of the time and they just don't care. They don't think that there's gonna be any sanction and by and large, they're right. Um, so you need to have that kind of body in place so that there is a sanction so that people don't break the rules. And then I think the other thing about a, a, a independent commission against corruption, which I probably hadn't appreciated until recently, is it is in itself a standing institution to try and get institutional reform in the rest of the system. So if you look at what the New South Wales um, uh, Commission has been up to, it has been publishing reports explaining why we need reform to the lobbying rules. Um, and laying out the case for doing that. There is nothing else in our system that is, if you like, paid to you know, advocate institutional reform. We have productivity commissions to advocate economic reforms. We have um, infrastructure bodies to advocate reforms with respect to transport um, and even things like congestion charging. Um, we have things like the ACCC to advocate for reforms, you know, around competition. But we have nothing at the moment that whose job it is to advocate for reforms to the institutions and a commission against corruption would, I think, really help. Mm. Excellent. Thank you. I'll, um, there's a lot of questions about donations, but we've, we've spent quite a lot of time on that. So I'll um, address one of the questions on freedom of information. Uh, and the uh, person who's asking this says, um, freedom of information has been placed out of the reach of the common person. Uh, is there any politician or political party interested in changing this situation for the better to make information more accessible? And another person on this topic asked, is Australia the world's most secretive democracy? Well, th this is a really interesting one, isn't it? I mean, recently, of course, uh, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal at the behest of Rex Patrick, made a very important finding that didn't surprise anybody except the government. And that was a finding that the National Cabinet does not possess cabinet confidentiality uh, and that therefore its dealings are open to access under a freedom of information application. Now you might just say, well, what's all that about? Well, you know, cabinet confidentiality is uh, very much part of the Westminster system and it's 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 a very valuable thing it just means that the, the the discussions of cabinet are confidential and that's because the government of the day which is <coughs> what the cabinet belongs to hasn't made up its mind whether it's going to introduce legislation or not but to describe a national cabinet that is a whole group of different political parties as a cabinet and therefore uh, being entitled to confidentiality was absolutely mm -hmm. 
ridiculous. And the administrative appeals decision brought that result clearly to the open. Guess what happened? Guess what happened? Within three weeks, a bill's introduced into parliament mm -hmm. to say that any uh, institution that the prime minister decides is a cabinet, is a cabinet. And it specifically said the national cabinet uh, is, is completely um, off limits for freedom of information. So I wouldn't say it's the most secretive country in the world, but it's certainly uh, se secrecy is a big part of this government's failure to be accountable and uh, failure to be transparent. And those sort of attributes often lead to loss of integrity. So it's all tied up together. I'll just jump in as well, just to point out that there's been a, a lot of um, legislation brought in since 9-11 uh, dealing with national security issues. And, and it seems that an extraordinarily large number of freedom of information requests are, or, or, or even, you know, requests from the Senate committees are, you know, blocked under the broad sort of banner of national security, which is a separate kind of concern. Having put in uh, lots of FOIs for this, you know, it's a very slow process. You often don't get the results. It's, you know, it should be improved a hell of a lot. And, you know, certain, yeah, <clears throat> problems with cost as well for the average person. It should be well and truly opened up. Yeah. And I think one of the great scandals of our time is the Bernard Caleri case, mm -hmm. uh, where the, the court processes, are the, the processes themselves are being shut down. So we're not entitled to see what's happening uh, for the main in the upcoming trial of Bernard Caleri. I mean, the fact that there's even a trial is, is a scandal in itself, but um, given that there is a trial on foot, we should be able to, the public should be able to know what's happening. And the, the, the way in which national security is used as a lever to close down and make things secret uh, has gone too far, in my opinion. Mm. And it's a problem because it's being used deliberately as a wedge. Um, uh, so the, the Liberals basically call something national security and, and come up with, you know, the latest piece of trying to shut down whatever, hoping that the ALP will, you know, oppose it and then they can call them weak on security. Uh, and so what we've just seen is this massive ratcheting up of national security um, uh, provisions. Um, uh, and it's, it's a real problem. You're absolutely right. We've expanded it well past. There are any number of things that the US, for example, um, is more than happy to make public that in Australia we don't. Uh, and we've just wound up with no force in the system whose job it is to say, um, we, you know, we don't need this. The, the security forces are always going to claim that they need more powers. Like that's kind of their job. Um, and we need forces in the system that say, you know what, if we set up a sensible balance between national security and all the other things we care about, you know, not least transparency in government, we shouldn't be drawing the line where you're suggesting. And we wound up with a system in which it's just nobody's job to push back anymore. And that's why we've had, I think we're now up to something like 90, 93 or something pieces of, of national security legislation since 9-11. And it's not obvious that it's made us a truckload safer. Yep. Um, another topic that's been coming up is um, around truth in advertising. And uh, I'll, I'll put it to whoever wants to answer this first, but do you support Starley Stegall's truth in political advertising bill? <laughs> Who wouldn't? In principle, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's extraordinary. Like it is, it's the part of the movie I had the most, we had the most fun in because you just go, the lack of restrictions on political advertising is so ridiculous. And we just took, we just took bits of Peter Dutton, put them together and made him say very defamatory things about himself because, you know, the whole point is if you're going to set up a lack of rules, there's no rules on, on, on government. I'm actually hoping that in a sense, this is in the same way that the Christian Porter issue has brought a bit more of a uh, light to this issue. I'm hoping that the way in which Craig Kelly and um, Clive Palmer are kind of abusing these rules because it's being set up in a way that, you know, if you're a political party, you get access to anyone's phone number and you don't have any restrictions on what you put out there. And 
Harmer and Craig Kelly are kind of a, a challenge to that system because they're taking this absolute lack of rules and just going, you know, hold my beer. Let's just go to the next level. So I, I'm fascinated to see if it finally means makes the, the, the major parties go, oh, shit, we've got to come. <laughs> we're going to close this down a little bit. To use John's word, the, the cartel will actually realise it's against them. Uh, there were a few questions that touched on policy. Uh, I will try to summarise them because I wasn't 100% sure what some of them meant, but they might mean something to you. So one was for John. Um, how do you see the weaker institutions in Australia affecting decisions made by successive governments and has it contributed to weaker productivity growth? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So some of the reforms that haven't happened are social reforms. Um, many of the reforms that haven't happened are economic reforms. And, you know, when you don't do economic reform, then you get less productivity growth than you would otherwise. So that's not the only thing we care about. Um, uh, but yeah, look, the entire point of the gridlock report is to show and connect up how these failures in our institutions are leading to failures to get substantive policy reform. And amongst other things, that leads to less um, productivity growth. It also leads to more inequality. It leads to poorer education. It leads to our health system costing more than it should, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of other things it doesn't help uh, as well. But productivity growth is certainly one of the things we care about a lot. And our institutions are effectively not helping as much as they should. Excellent. Thank you. Um, finishing on uh, what might potentially could be a more amusing note, um, Craig, have you had any feedback from politicians on the big deal? What are they saying? Um, not at this point. I haven't had too much. I mean, it's, I'm not sure if we haven't done it. We haven't done a parliamentary screening yet. So I'm not sure how many of you see it. I'll be interested once it's on the ABC in October. So I, I look forward. I mean, but this is one thing I should say about this is that I think it's wrong to think that all politicians don't want to change this. Mm. As a matter of fact, there's a large amount in probably all of the parties that do want to change this. And I think, you know, we probably all know people who went to politics with great intentions, right? And actually you went, oh, I'd really like that person was great. How come they're not really achieving what they want? And that's because there's these different constraints. I kind of call this part of democracy is like the cancer on the rest of the party that undermines what's going on. And so it means that your, you know, your Sam Dastiari has a, his own power in the party because he's bringing money in. Or if you're a big fundraiser, you have a lot of power. Or if you're the person, that, and as John says in his report, if you're the person that decides where the money goes, you have a lot of power. And not all politicians like that because they're there trying to do their job and in some cases serve their constituents. So I think that, you know, don't presume that your politicians don't want to change this. The thing they need, though, is they think, need to see that the public cares about it. Because if they don't do that, then when they go to the party side of it and go, we need to change this, they go, no, 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 we need the money. So, you know, they've got to know that the public are behind them to actually get that change. And can I also add, that if you want to see uh, uh, an experience, a really good experience with a politician, have a long chat to Helen Haynes. Um, what she said to me um, in quite an open fashion was how refreshing it was for her to be able to work as a politician, a parliamentarian, without the constrictions and confines of a political party dominating her every thought and telling her what to do. And so she works in accordance with her conscience and her sense of integrity, and it's tremendously refreshing. So the voices of Wentworth and the voices of all these other places around Australia, I hope will become a breeding ground for other independents to come forward and work on the basis of their integrity rather than going in and becoming a political hack in a political system. Mm. I'll just say as well, we're very um, we're privileged to also, I've seen Cathy McGowan's on the call tonight, I've seen a couple of questions and oh, there she is <laughs> saying hello. Um, so welcome to you, Cathy. Um, and certainly that's the discussions that we have with people in Wentworth and, and in other electorates as well, is that there's very much a feeling that people want to um, make their voices heard so that, well, to, to achieve change and to get integrity in politics and, and other policy areas um, reformed. And yes, as you say, raising your voice and having um, that communication with your local MP and enabling the MP to understand what 
people want in the in the electorate is was also a key part of that. So um, we'll continue to work very hard and um, we've got a lot of work to do. We've, we've come a long way, but we've got more to do. So um, thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. We're going to wrap up now because we could carry on talking for a long time about this, I'm sure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Just before you go, I just need to wrap up. I'm going to say um, to everyone watching, we hope this has been a really engaging session um, and it'll assist you to talk confidently with your friends and your neighbours and your colleagues about some of the issues that are raised today. Um, and why integrity in politics um, should be and must be a really important thing to think about at the next election. My dogs are joining in. Um, we've, we're currently conducting a voter survey to find out what Wentworth voters care about, and we'll be publishing the results early next year. Sorry. Um, Celia, do you want to do it for me because the dogs are going crazy? Sure. Uh... I think we got up to the survey. So we're currently conducting a voter survey to find out uh, what Wentworth voters care about. And we'll be publishing the results early next year before inviting our current MP, Dave Sharma, and all Wentworth candidates, whoever they may be, to participate in a public forum with voters prior to the next federal election. Uh, so if you are in the Wentworth electorate, please take five minutes to complete the survey, which I'm hoping Kath will now put into the chat. Um, keep an eye out for information of our next town hall in October, which will be on the topic of women's safety. Uh, we'll also be holding another virtual Voices in the Pub night, which uh, we've been holding about once a month, where people can come along. We like to do these things live. It has a wonderful atmosphere, but we have been able to recreate some of that atmosphere doing this virtually by um, people coming into a Zoom and we put them into rooms of around seven or eight people to talk about what their concerns are so that one of our scribes can uh, take a note and that then goes into our report. So it's your opportunity to share your views and what matters to you. Uh, so please send us an email if you would like to um, join that event or you can respond on Facebook. Um, thank you so much for everybody joining us and thanks Kath for leading us through that discussion. Thank you everyone. I'm sorry about my dogs going crazy um, at the end there, but <laughs> <laughs> it was a great conversation. We look forward to the next time. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. And Craig.